Welcome back for those of you who've been here before. Welcome to the next installment of this series at the Whitney Humanities Center at Yale called The Value of Marx's Capital. A little bit tongue in cheek, but um, we're trying to think about the new values that can be produced by reading it differently and reading it today with some of the most interesting interpreters of the text of the moment. These are the Frankie Lectures in the Humanities. Um, the series is a companion to an undergraduate seminar at Yale. Can you all just give me a thumbs up if you can hear me? Okay, good, thank you. Got nervous there for a minute. Um, and it also goes along with the work that my collaborator, Paul Reiter at OSU, is doing on a new translation of volume one into English. Um, which I am co-editing with him that should be out, we hope, in our lifetimes. Um, I need to thank, first of all, um, the Frankie family who make possible the Frankie lectures. That's Richard and Barbara Frankie. These lectures are intended to present important topics in the humanities to a wide and general audience. I'd like to thank Alice Kaplan, the director of the Whitney Humanities Center, who is already doing brilliant things, beginning in her first term. Uh, uh, Sandra Malan Bowles, who's an administrator at the Whitney, who's organized everything in the, in the back end. Leanna hirschfeld Crowen, who's our graduate assistant, who's organized everything on the front end. And Audrey Leek, who is our undergraduate assistant running the show, the technological show. We're going to do what we always do, which is have a presentation. Um, and after that, we'll take questions. I'm going to ask you to keep your questions uh, note them down and then to put them in the chat after I give the signal and we'll go through them one by one as they're relevant to the talk. Don't post your questions now because they'll get lost. I'd like to start with a quotation from a work by our author and here I'm going to quote from the introduction to a book edited by Titi Bhattacharya, Social Reproduction Theory in 2017. Quote, if, as we propose, the special separation between production, public, and reproduction, private, is a historical form of appearance, then the labor that is dispensed in both spheres must also be theorized integratively. I take this to be a kind of a motto and a project that um, she has been carrying out for many years. And I'd like to introduce her. Professor Titi Bhattacharya is a uh, a professor of South Asian history and director of global studies at Purdue University. She's the author of The Sentinels of Culture, Class Education, and the Colonial Intellectual in Bengal from 2005, and has been a longtime activist for Palestinian justice. She's a type of person who brings her intellectual work together with her work as a social ju justice activist in the most admirable way, locally, across the world with students. So I'm really very happy that she's here. She's written extensively on Marxist theory, on gender, and her work has been published in the Journal of Asian Studies, um, South Asia Research, and she is one of the authors of Feminism for the 99%, along with um, Chinsia Arutza, who's going to be here at the end of the series, and Nancy Fraser. I'd like all of us to, if we can, Virtually applaud and welcome Titi Bhattacharya to the series. Welcome. Thank you, Paul, for that very, very generous introduction. Um, I also have um, a few thank yous before I start. Um, thank you, Paul Norse and Paul Reiter, for inviting me to this uh, brilliant project of um, sort of discussing a capital volume one at a moment of real crisis in our world and discussing it with uh, not just um, the, the general public, but also very crucially with undergraduates in the university. So thank you. I also want to thank Liana and Audrey for uh, helping um, me with the, with the presentation. And thank you to all of you who are tuning in and I look forward to um, engaging with you um, on this issue. This is a very um, important um, seminar series and a very unique one 
because I, I had the good fortune to actually hear my, uh, the previous speakers for this, um, at this seminar. And it, it's unique because usually when I speak about um, Capital Volume 1 or Marxist theory in general, I have to spend a lot of time introducing what social reproduction theory is. In this seminar, um, my colleague and comrade Lucia Pradella has already introduced a social reproduction theory before, um, before my talk. So I'm very grateful that this has already been a live category of engagement and conversation. So um, I'm going to start um, with I'm sorry, I, there is something <laughs> wrong. Should we here. put up your slide presentation? Are we at that moment? Um, no, it's, that um, sorry, it's, um, it's, it, it's not, um, somehow my file is not opening <laughs> properly. Um, I'm sorry, I apologize. Okay, it, it is now, okay. So, um, Capital, um, for most of you who have engaged with the text quite extensively already, know that it is, of course, about the working class, and hence it is about labor. But this claim can appear a bit controversial because, barring a few passages and the very famous chapter on the working day, Capital as a text is actually predominantly concerned with abstract labor or the value form of labor. So what do I mean about the value form of labor? Meaning that the text talks not so much about work or labor, except that famous um, chapter, but about labor power, the capacity to labor, which is what the worker is forced to sell to the capitalist, and the text also spends a lot of time discussing how that labor power through a rather torturous process turns into surplus value or profit. But since it is capital that best teaches us that the value form violates and extinguishes all sensuous properties of human labor, Marx's central concern in capital appears to be tracing the procedures of that extinguishment rather than establishing the subjective conscious aspects of human labor. This particular reading of capital as a text organized solely around the form de determination of wage labor has actually led some Marxists to make a further analytical leap about the indifference, if you like, of capitalism as a mode of production. So for instance, Ellen Mixon Good, a prominent advocate of this view has argued that, Audrey, could we have the first slide please? Thank you. So it's the next slide, Audrey, thank you. So uh, Ellen Wood has argued that sexual and racial equality are not in principle incompatible with capitalism. The disappearance of class inequality, on the other hand, is by definition incompatible with capitalism. So in other words, uh, you know, we can have a capitalism where there is no sexual or racial inequal uh, inequality, but we can't have a capitalism where there's class um, equality. In this reading of Marx, capitalism as a system is reconstructed as the first and only exploitative system that does not require the production and sustenance of extra economic inequalities. The existence of such inequalities is seen as contingent rather than exigent to the system whose reproduction can be assured simply through the wage form or through the extraction of surplus value between economically unequal, but juridically equal subjects. Social reproduction theory, a conceptual apparatus primarily developed from capital by Marxist feminists, I will argue today, offers a reading of capitalism and of Capital Volume 1 that is actually more consistent with Marx's own method 
than this hypothesis of capitalist indifference. Next slide, please. So I make this argument in three separate but related ways. First, at a general level, by looking at the status of labor in capital. Uh, second, through a more specific argument about capitalism's systemic unity. And this sort of harkens back to the, the quote that uh, Paul um, used from uh, my, my essay earlier. And, so, and finally, through an empirical argument about how it is exactly that labor power is differentiated, dividing the working class into distinct sectors. So let me preface my argument with some very brief remarks about social reproduction theory, or SRT, and its theoretical contours. Fundamentally, SRT theorizes labor power and the practices that enable its reproduction within capitalist social relations, situated within and following from the conceptual architecture of capital, SRT proposes that, next slide please, uh, one, the labor expended in the production of commodities, that is at the point of production, and the labor expended for the production of people or workers who produce such commodities are part of the same capitalist totality and together constitutive of value. And the second proposal is that the working class family is the primary, but not the only, site for the reproduction of labor power or the reproduction of the working class as a whole. Further, SRT identifies capital's contradictory relationship to labor power as a key feature of the system. How is it contradictory? Because on the one hand, capital needs a steady, predictable circuit for the reproduction of labor power, since it is the source of capital's profit and hence its own reproduction. So it has to have reliable means that labor power is reproduced constantly. But on the other hand, that labor power is actually reproduced by human beings. And hence, how it is reproduced, to what extent labor power's capacities are developed, or the human capacities are developed, may not always align with capital's needs. Thus, all sites and processes for the reproduction of labor power are ultimately arenas of contestation between labor and capital. The former constantly tending towards a greater share of civilization to develop and further human capacities. So that's labor's job. While the latter, i.e. capital, straining to reduce such a share and mold labor power and such capacities to create and maintain the productive worker that capital needs. So let's, let's look at some examples, right? So think about what kind of um, a worker uh, capitalism needs and how do we attain it? So in that sense, you know, uh, you have, um, you know, great discipline at schools to produce the perfect, um, you know, subject for work later on in life. Um, you have, um, you know, the heteronormative family as the ideal that capital is most comfortable with in order to reproduce labor power. So you have all these institutions, but then these institutions do not always work as reliably as possible because look, we are at Yale and we are teaching Capital Volume 1, i.e. we are encouraging you to actually think about the system rather than comply with the system. So there's always the, this sort of contradictory relationship between the processes of the production of commodities and the processes of the production of labor power. So slide five, please. And we can see that this contestation happens, uh, I'm, I'm not sure if you can see uh, both of the photographs very well, that this contestation then can happen both at the point of production and outside of it. The first photo is of um, 
homeowners in Chicago actually um, protesting redlining, and the second is a point of production, um, you know, obviously a, a worker strike at, at Woolworths. And we'll, we'll talk about this more later. So SRT then is at its core concerned with the gendered racialized reproduction of labor power and capital as text is fundamentally concerned with how surplus value is produced and with what consequences. Then how are the two related? So Positions such as Ellen Wood's above that we talked about try to demonstrate that capitalist social relations as they unfold historically ought to be theoretically separated out from the abstract or logical architecture of capitalism. So in this view, you can have a historic capitalism, which is how it really happens, but capital volume one, it can be argued is actually the abstraction and, and is not really about history or, or anything. So this particular derivation of capital um, and approach to capitalism are, in my view, actually at odds with both Marx's methodology and the project of capital. Capital volume one is indubitably about the value form of labor. And we can certainly find passages in Marx which might support the argument that economic categories ought to be considered distinctly from their historic unfolding. However, we cannot lose sight of the fact that what distinguishes Marx's method from non-Marxist ones, say Ricardo's concept of fixed essences, is that Marx rejects a separation between reality and its apprehension in thought. Instead, his methodology establishes a dialectical unity between them, operating simultaneously at both logical and historical levels. Uh, to be clear, Marx is um, not proposing a simple unity between theory and reality in any naturalistic way, but of how theoretical categories actually derive from historic developments. This does not mean that such categories are reflective of immediate appearances. Indeed, as we know from our reading of Marx, they may be their mirror opposites. Rather, his method discloses a constant upward spiral movement between theory and reality, or appearance and essence, however you want to think about it, becoming more complex at each successive level of determination. So this relationship between Capital Volume One as a theoretical text and history or reality existing outside of the text is often cast as a relationship between abstract categories and concrete histories, right? So, so far we've argued that there is a relationship between the abstract categories and concrete history, but actually Marx goes much further than this simple um, relationality. So what is an abstract category? Let's try to unpack that a bit. An abstract category commonly understood is a static one, right? One that doesn't move, doesn't change with historical change and so on. An unmoving part separated from a dynamic whole, which can reveal to the analyst key features of that whole, because that whole is impossible to study in, in, in its totality or, or complete complexity. Marx himself uses several such abstractions, money, commodity being you know, two, two of the most common ones to understand history and the nature of capitalism. But unlike bourgeois approaches to abstraction, Marx's methodology refuses all static forms. Hence, one of the you know, uh, key theorists, uh, according to me, of uh, Marx's uh, um, method, uh, which is uh, Bertel Ullman. Uh, Bertel Ullman has argued that Marx sets out to abstract things, in his words, as they really are and happen, making how they happen part of what they are. Hence, capital or labor or money is not only how capital appears and functions, but also how it develops or rather 
how it develops its real history is also part of what it is. So um, just to sort of do an aside here, if, if, um, if you remember uh, in, in the German ideology, he and Engels mock Bruno Bauer for attempting to prove an antithetical relationship between nature and history as if, and Marx says, and I quote, these were two separate things, unquote. In contrast, a Marxist abstraction, so this sort of category that you abstract from the whole to understand the whole, a Marxist abstraction encloses within it both a history of its becoming while disclosing its possible future. For instance, within the abstract category capital, we also find its past, which is the so-called primitive accumulation, as well as forecasts of its future, constant expansion through surplus value extraction, the accumulation drive, creating the world market, and so on. So the past, as well as the future, is enclosed in the abstract category uh, of, of capital. So while we may find these categories in whole or in part in other epochs of history, i.e. in other modes of production, like we will find money or you know, labor and so on, they either remain unrealized in their function or play entirely different roles from their current incarnation. What they combine, when they combine in the capitalist mode of production, they do so as being simultaneously saturated with their past while establishing new relationships within themselves. So the history of pre-capitalist practices thus cannot be separated or severed from the explanatory categories of capitalism. So this is a digression in sort of abstract, how the methodology that I think is, is useful in going back to reading capital. And once you know, we have this methodology in place, let us now revisit Ellen Wood's claim that the extraction of pri uh, surplus value is the primary concern for capital, and hence how that process happens, i.e., whether that process happens to racialize, gendered, or ableist means is actually incidental to capital's central pursuit, right? So remember, we are now talking, so if we use that idea, then Marxist methodology doesn't really apply because as we try to establish that the abstract in Marx actually discloses the history of the category itself and discloses its unfolding. So e as we've already then established that even abstract categories in Marx carry historical lineages and futurial allusions. In a sense, this should be enough to reject Wood's claim of capitalist indifference. But there is actually a case to be made for indifference as regards to capitalist forms. Not, however, in the way that Ellen Wood conceives of it. So let us take the abstract category labor as it appears in Marx. It is just banally true that human beings have always labored in a diversity of historical epochs and social formations. But labor as a simple category that Marx uses to build the theoretical infrastructure of capital, volume one, uh, when economically conceived in this simplicity, says Marx, it becomes, and I quote, um, a modern category as the relations which create this simple abstraction. So, capital, so under capitalism, labor as such, not any specific kind of labor, not the uh, you know, sort of act of you know, building a table or teaching or cooking, not any specific kind of labor, but labor as such becomes the basis for the creation of wealth. To conceive of labor in this, its most simple form, was an analytical leap taken by classical political economy, which actually Marx is very uh, much in support of and, and you know, absolutely um, uh, gives props to Adam Smith. 
uh, he's, he wrote, uh, it was a tremendous advance on the part of Adam Smith um, to throw aside every limiting specification of wealth creating activity, not only manufacturing or commercial or agricultural labor, but one as well as the others, labor in general. So, you know, the, the Smith first uh, came upon this um, idea and, and Marx follows very much from it. But how did classical political economy arrive at this generalized form of labor? Not simply because laboring was an ahistorical category common to all epochs, but because labor under capitalism had become for the first time labor in general. So the theoretical conception of this general or simple form of labor was only possible in the historical actuality of very developed totality of real kinds of labor of which no single one was any longer predominant, unquote, as Marx put it. So abstraction, in this case, the abstract category of labor, arose from the very many determinations of the concrete while the concrete could only be conceived of as such through the simple abstraction. So it is only when the system itself, the historical system itself was indifferent to what kind of labor, remember the first like five chapters of Capital Volume One, right? So all of you've gone through it. So, um, so the most general abstractions, Marx reminds us, arise only in the midst of the richest possible concrete development, and I quote Marx, where one thing appears as common to many, to all, then it ceases to be thinkable in a particular form alone, right? So it was the historical development and the concrete unfolding of it that allowed classical political economists to have uh, to, to make that analytical leap towards abstraction. So you can see here, I'm sort of building this argument that the concrete and the abstract actually have a relationship in Marx in the methodology. So now you can see where I will go with this, with whether uh, the creation of surplus value is indifferent to how surplus value is produced, right? So that's, that's the argument we are leading up to with all this uh, discussion on the abstract and the concrete. It is because indifference in real sense is expressed in the historical form that it can be grasped as such in the abstract theoretical form. Um, it is because individuals in capitalist society can fluidly move from one form of labor to another that both the category labor and labor in reality has become, and I quote Marx, the means of creating wealth in general and has ceased to be organically linked to particular individuals in any specific form. Hence, far from there being an abstract capitalism indifferent to historical forms and an historical capitalism marked by concrete social relations, Marx's methodology urges critical thought to unite theory and re reality in actually transformatively radical ways, right? So we don't need to have this sort of historical capitalism versus abstract capitalism. We should actually think about, Marx's methodology challenges us to think about uh, rejecting this sort of a division in thinking, but think about a dialectical unity at, within the categories themselves. So, um, Accordingly, Marx posits abstract labor in Capital Volume One, and you, you are all very aware of this, very carefully. And he posits it as one aspect of his labor theory of value. Subjective forms are concrete labor, the analytical twin of abstract labor, and social labor through which the value form is organized, are all understood as different aspects of labor operating as in unity, right? So um, most importantly, Capital Volume One is about why and how abstract labor dominates over the other aspects and submits them to the law of value. 
right? So that's really, but it doesn't mean that there is an abstract labor that we study about, and then there's concrete labor. It, it actually shows you why abstract labor dominates over concrete labor. If the um, other aspects of labor, like concrete labor and social labor, appear as muted shadows of abstract labor, then it is not because Marx is reporting on reality in any simple way. These other categories in capital have a much more significant role to play in the totality of Marx's argument. Concrete labor or social labor actually, th these theoretical categories actually signal the limits to capitalism's ability to reduce workers to simply being potential sources of surplus value. Okay, so we should think about these categories not simply as explaining uh, how surplus value is created, but also these categories signal the limits to what capital can extract from us. So let us look more closely then at the relationship between abstract and concrete labor and their respective roles in capitalism. A system organized on the basis of abstract labor, as we argued before, can only appear when different forms of concrete labor performed by historically situated people are forced into a relationship of equivalence via the market, production for which takes place solely for profit rather than for human need. So the system reproduces itself through the production of commodities, a process involving abstract labor or labor in its value form, but constantly rubbing against this process while nested within it, human beings reproduce their lives through concrete, historically laden actions. Reproduction of life-making practices and the reproduction of value must be simultaneous and continuous, okay? Which is the reality of capitalism, but also a sense of anxiety for capital, right? Because it does not have the kind of control it has at the point of production over the production of commodities, it doesn't have the same control over the production of life making or uh, reproduction of life making, if you like, because it doesn't happen at the point of production. So slide six, please. Um, two preconditions attend to such a system, that is capitalism. One, that people are forcibly torn from the means of production such that access to their subsistence or life making is only available through the mechanism of the market. And second, if the system is able to ensure its continued reproduction by reproducing the social relations that scaffold the market and the extraction of surplus value. In other words, capitalist social relations must continually reproduce the worker's dependence on capital. So both things, as you can see here in this wonderful feminist um, graphic from the 1970s, both things are happening at the same time. The woman is split down in the middle um, to, to my left. Uh, she is um, you know, performing labor in, in the uh, domestic sphere. Um, many of you listening in can identify with that, especially during pandemic times um, of uh, your children at home and uh, pulling at your skirt. And on the right, on my right, she is also working in the workplace. And um, you can see, I always find this very interesting because there is a, there is a clock that, that marks time in, in the workplace. So, so it's, a, it's a wonderful image that shows uh, you know, both sides of capital, how uh, capital reproduces itself as, as a system. So the dominance of abstract over concrete labor, of value over use value, create the conditions for and necessitate the production of a worker compliant to capital's every whim. Okay, because if there isn't a compliant worker, then there would be no system. So that's, that's capital's need, right? But if this were the whole story of capital's volume one, then celebration of its 150th birthday would be held at Wall Street. But how, if at all, is then resistance part of this story? 
If Marx's theory requires all parts of a social totality to be connected through internal relations, how can resistance to capital be shown to be imminent to the reproduction of capital, right? Because resistance can't be from the outside. It can't be an external relation. That's, that's going against Marx's methodology. And this is where, to go back to our point, social reproduction theory, deploying capital's methodology, but building upon some of its silences, affects a category transformation of the concept of labor power as the analytical causeway, the analytical bridge between capitalist reproduction and anti-capitalist resistance. So even the most creative reading of the concept of labor power and capital shows, and this is you know, the feminists' big fight with Capital Volume One, that the text presupposes the existence of what is being reproduced. So labor power is just there in Capital Volume One, in, theoretically. It's a category that's just there. Discussion of labor power begins not from where or how it has been societally produced, but the ways in which, in its commodity form, it sustains the production of surplus value. Differently put, conceptualization of labor power in the text is limited to the form in which it is useful to capital. SRT agitates this capital-oriented view of labor power and performs, in theory, a reverse movement away from the site of commodity production to the site of the reproduction of labor power. So labor power, for those of you who've read the text, um, I, I'm, I'm talking about the students in, in the seminar, um, you know that it is nominated variously in capital as unique, special, peculiar commodity, because it is presented as the only commodity, and in Marx's famous words, whose use value possesses the peculiar property of being a source of value. And I'm so excited to, to see how um, Paul Reiser and Paul Norris will, will translate that, that passage. I've, I'm really excited to learn from that. Um, but SRT reveals that there is another aspect to labor power's peculiarity. It is a commodity, undoubtedly, but it is a commodity that is not produced capitalistically. That is within the direct ambit of the capital wage relation, labor relation, right? So it's produced outside of it. Uh, you know, uh, the, 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 the feminist who pioneered some of this uh, thinking, Lisa Vogel, has shown that it is produced and reproduced what Lisa, call, um, Lisa Vogel calls a kin-based site, which is the working class family. So this insight is, is crucial, and it is crucial in three important respects. First, because it expresses the dialectical unity of what we had argued previously between the historical and logical form of capital, right? Labor power, SRT shows, can only become available to capital through distinct but reliable sets of gendered, racialized social relations that create their own institutional forms of sustenance, such as the monogamous heteronormative family form. Older historical forms may be recast, new forms may be created and mobilized, but it is only through concrete social relations and sensuous human labor that labor power is produced and made available to capital. Second, being attentive to labor power, not as it appears before capital, but as it is produced and reproduced, SRT introduces, or rather restores, to capitalist totality, a sphere of social relations where life-making activities proliferate. While capital's goal is to increase surplus value in the sphere of production, the worker's goal is to enhance her quality of life or a qualitative enrichment of her labor power and her selfhood through the satisfaction of her needs. SRT reminds us of the power of these life-making activities by workers for they seek to impose breaks on the process of accumulation as capital is forced to pay for them through wages and social benefits. 
So look at, let's go back and look at this picture, right? So look, look at the, what is to my left side of, of, the, of the graphic, which is one way that uh, th this uh, woman worker could enhance the quality of the left side of her uh, <laughs> of her work sphere is by having public childcare. These these um, the the crying child on the floor would actually be at a public, well funded government childcare institution. Uh, you can see um, that she's ironing, so we could have public laundries and, and so on. And so if on the right side of the graphic, she went on strike to demand that, then that is actually, again, putting a break on the accumulation process for her to enhance the quality of her life. So you see there is a relationship between the production of commodity and the reproduction of labor power. So finally, there is a clear strategic component to SRT. Life-making social practices by workers are not simply congeries of activities to satisfy needs. They have the potential to carry an anti-capitalist charge. Struggles to enhance or expand such practices will always reveal the balance of class forces, that I want better public health care. In fact, I want my health care to be free. I want education to be free. This is not to claim that any or all struggles by workers to improve their living conditions are all anti-systemic struggles. Um, but it is to argue that, um, uh, that, that they carry that the potential for that sort of um, uh, anti-capitalist charge. Um, the, the struggles uh, that are about enhancing the sphere of life making for workers can thus reveal often implicitly, but sometimes explicitly, the upper limits to what the working class can claim in its goal for self enhancement and liberation. Thus they carry the potential of teaching the worker in struggle, the most important political lesson about capitalism. That while the wage form life-making activities can never be free of the drive for accumulation and thus real emancipation of life and labor is only possible with the abolition of the wage form, right? So we can demand, for instance, that we have free abortion on demand, we have free medical um, care or free education, and in certain contexts, capital will even grant that, but immediately try to claw it back when it can, right? So again, this sort of struggle to constantly win back from capital our life-making activities or our potential for expanded life-making activities is a continuous process and it'll never end till the abolition of the wage form itself. So if SRT establishes um, the non-capitalistic production of labor power and its reproduction through particular gendered and racialized social relations, it also raises more troubling questions about the procedures of its reproduction. The production of value and the extraction of surplus value as demonstrated in capital have certain tendencies and counter tendencies that seek equalization throughout the system. But the hallmark of capitalism surely is its deep social inequality both between the capitalist class and workers and within the classes themselves. So the production of surplus value unpacks the secret of inequalities between capital and labor, but what explains the sustenance of inequality amongst workers, right? What explains the wage gap? What explains the racialized wage gap? So traditional Marxist accounts of racism within the working class, for example, locate the production and reproduction of race in labor market competition. The argument goes, 
that workers compete with each other as individual sellers of labor power on the market, and historically dominant sections of the class compete with the more vulnerable sections of the class over jobs, pensions, and social benefits, right? So all of the racism is then reproduced or produced in the first place within the labor market itself, right? For competing jobs and so on. So I agree with the broad outlines of this account. But I think SRT urges us to push the question of differentiation further and pitch it not just at the le level of the labor market, but at the level of production of the value of labor power, okay? So the labor market is about the price of labor power, but we want to situate the question at the level of production of the value of labor power, okay? So the value of labor power as a commodity, we all know, and this is again your first five chap uh, chapters of Capital Volume 1, uh, like all commodities under capitalism, the value of labor power is determined by the value of the means of subsist subsistence that is needed for its reproduction. So next slide, please. So this is your... Um, Sorry, Audrey, the next slide, please. Oh, there we go. Thank you. Um, so um, the, um, you know, and, and there are actually, it is actually almost institutionally recognized sometimes because that's what the federal minimum wage is, right? Forget the fact that it's been stuck there. But, um, but you know, the, the wage basket, as it were, is your means of subsistence that creates a uh, uh, the, the labor power, okay? But Marx reminds us that for this peculiar commodity, labor power, and, and, and in contradistinction from all the other kind of commodities under capitalism, there enters what Marx calls, quote unquote, a historical and moral element in the determination of its value. Now, what the hell does that mean? Because he says, that there may be I'm a sorry. Okay. I just thought I um sorry. That's okay. <laughs> um so what is the historical and moral element? So this uh, Marx introduces this concept to, to say this that there might be a lower limit to what the laboring body needs to reproduce itself, right? So there is only you can only like be hungry to a certain level or thirsty to a certain level, after which the human body will die. So there can be a lower limit to what the body needs to go to work the next day, okay? But there can be no fixed upper limit to the worker's necessary needs, as needs themselves are dynamic, historically produced, and shaped by the gains made by the working class through struggle. So a worker in the 1930s in Bangladesh, well, not in Bangladesh at the time, India uh, has to be, a worker in 1930s in British India will have very different needs from the worker in 2020 in India or Bangladesh or the worker in the US today, right? So, so because those, what we think we absolutely need to go to work the next day. What reproduces our labor power, it varies between countries, between times, and so what Marx calls is, is a dynamic process. So um, uh, in the number and extent of a worker's necessary wants, thus Marx confirms, are themselves the product of historical development, right? So uh, let's go to, to slide eight. So, so we can see in, in, the, in uh, the next slide, uh, you know, some of the things that, um, that, the, that the worker, uh, uh, sorry, that, that we have come to accept as, sorry, the next slide, please. So, so necessary ones we ha we've come to accept as 
something that exists. And I want to talk about the, the two figures here, the correction and law enforcement in a little bit. But this we, we take for granted as some of the things today that we take for granted as necessary wants that we have to, uh, to reproduce um, as, uh, the, the, the workers. So if necessary wants which determine the value of labor power are historical and dynamic, it follows then that different sections of the working class produced at different moments of history will have different standards of necessary wants, right? The work Irish worker for Marx in direct contrast with her English counterpart embodied this, this production of difference. For Marx said that the Irish worker was, and I quote, at that level of wage labor who accepted the most animal minimum of needs and subsistence in her exchange with capital, unquote. Okay, so the Irish worker uh, accepted much, uh, a, a, a much higher degree of exploitation than the English worker, uh, uh, according to Mark. So this version of productive difference then situates difference in the very operation of labor power's reproduction, which means that labor power have already been differentiated, reproduced, even before it reaches the field of labor market competition. Indeed, even the access or entry into labor market cannot be a presupposition as such access and entry across different sections of the class uh, precisely uh, exists precisely due to differential reproduction. So now let's go back to, um, to the correction and the, and the police uh, law enforcement actually these two categories in any working class community has a very differential effect on black workers latino workers than it has uh, than they have on, on on white workers okay the kind of disciplining uh, categories that exist have very different kind of expectations and notion of necessary wants than uh, between black and white workers or latino workers so attention to social reproductive activities then reveal the specific social processes through which certain workers embody certain qualities of labor power arrive at the doorstep of capital more vulnerable and degraded than others. Ruthlessly depressed levels of necessary wants for Latino workers in the US is one example of brutally differentiated processes of social reproduction between migrant workers and their citizen counterparts. The median space per person in a Latino household in the US is 350 square feet, 80 square feet less than, the, than that of the average non-migrant family living below the poverty line. Okay, so in a similar vein, uh, we, I, I, I don't need to go through all of this, but if you, if you look at how COVID-19 has um, affected black uh, working class communities and Latino working class communities compared to white working class communities, it is very clear that previous processes of social differentiation, redlining, environmental racism had already made these communities far more vulnerable. So when the disease fi finally hit, it obviously had a differential response in these communities, as well as, you know, not just, not just those kind of uh, redlining and environmental racism, but where, you know, um, uh, uh, factories producing uh, um, environmentally, um, degrading products were, are cited far more frequently in Black communities than they are in non-Black communities, right? So this has been established. The New York Times have actually done uh, pretty decent reporting uh, on, on redlining and industrial waste in, in recent times. So uh, we, we are looking at then the, 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 the factor that certain communities are historically reproduced to be more vulnerable even before they hit the labor market, okay? So the idea that the differentiation happens in the labor market, then we, we need to sort of revise and look at these veins of social reproduction that exists before 
the, the worker gets to the door of, of the labor market. So access to housing, police violence, substandard schools and healthcare are obvious ingredients that determine the level of necessary wants for a section of the working class and thereby determine and lower the value of their labor power. But the lowering of value for one section of workers always has a conditioning impulse for all sections. For lower wages for some workers can allow capital to rationalize and lower wages for all workers. So degraded social reproduction of racialized workers thus can help establish a regime of cheapened wages for all. So I want to conclude by circling back to the morphology of labor power as within it is fused the argument offered in capital and the significance of SRT. So while it is true that capitalism tries to produce the working class it needs, Capital Volume 1 shows us that workers' struggle against the wage form is a necessary part of the internal dynamics of the system and its reproduction. The worker will always tend towards the development of her own needs through life-making activities while capital will continually tend towards limiting such activities to increase its share of surplus value and hence civilization. Collective organizing on the basis of solidarity remains the only way the working class can win this unequally resourced battle against capital. The warning we receive from SRT, however, is that a multiracial working class unity will not arise spontaneously through either left-wing propaganda or voluntarism for the differentiation of the working class is produced and sustained at a cellular level of the system. It is clear that vicious border policies, gendered and racialized labor regimes are only some of the ways in which uh, capitalism seeks to globally reproduce the working class in combined but deeply unequal ways. Against this warning, the aspiration we receive from SRT is equally important. As a unitary theory, revealing the relationship between point of production of commodities and the spaces of reproduction of labor power, SRT imbues every struggle for enhanced social reproduction with anti-capitalist possibilities. A working class movement that will be able to give form to such possibilities cannot simply retrace older cultures of solidarity, but it will have to actively forge new ones. Such a movement must champion with equal vigor working class struggles based in communities around water, around police violence, around housing, alongside workplace struggles. It will have to learn to articulate demands on a double register, sim simultaneously appealing to the universal and the specific. We should simultaneously demand universal health care, but make specific demands for access to reproductive care, for better health care for Black people, and, and so forth. There shouldn't be these should not be understood as two counterposed strategies, but as two moments in a single necessary process. Next slide, please. So if Capital Volume 1 remains one of the most savage critiques of capitalism as a system, SRT, or social reproduction theory, can perhaps be thought of as animating that critique with embodied voices of workers in struggle. Thank you. Thank you very much. This is the hole that we fall into at the end of every talk where there would be thunderous applause. I know that there's that's happening and that there's also um, feelings of a possible new solidarity. So thank you for the talk. I want to kick off with a question and then we can start asking folks if they want to put questions in the chat and we will take them in order. Okay, I, I want to ask you this question. Um, so I've thought for a long time that the division of labor is one of the fundamental motors of capital volume one and of capital as Marx sees it. That's not just a static thing or an, an advantage to capital that labor be divided, but it's a kind of dynamic motor in which it keeps getting divided and redivided um, 
to the for the um, the purpose of increasing accumulation. And I really like that um, the reproductive space is brought into this by SRT. It was always there, um, but it's brought into this as a an effect of um, the division of labor, part of the division of labor, almost as though there's a continuum, and that the the production floor is right next to the reproduction floor. And these forces are working uh, on both of them. I guess I want to ask if, um, um, if you see them still as, or if you see them as qualitatively different, these two moments, if we, we should consider them both labor in the same way, if um, putting them on a continuum makes a stronger possibility for solidarity, and if there have been examples in history where, um, let's say, the domestic sphere and the production sphere have gone out on strike together, you showed two images and the woman is split in half, but are there, are there examples that you know of where this solidarity has happened? Great question, Paul. So, um, so first of all, you know the the division is is um, in a, in a sense when we're talking about it, we, we're talking about it to to to, um, to make it easy to analyze, right? So the division is a theoretical division, but in reality, you know uh, the the processes um, happen has to happen simultaneously, right? So uh, it's it's a conceptual division that we've created in order to understand the the process. So uh, let me start by saying how it's different rather than how it's same, because I think we've talked about you know how it's simultaneous and how it's same. So uh, let's think about the difference. So first of all, you know. Domestic labor, while completely the the precondition, if you like, to wage labor, right? So if there was no um, domestic labor, there would be no wage labor. So while it's a precondition to wage labor, however, domestic labor does not produce value. So we could not have equalized uh, uh, time for diaper change across all household units of a social formation you know and thereby uh, you know uh, produce value from from it so it doesn't produce value in that sense even though it is actually uh, the precondition to the production of value so that's that's one for sure we cannot have equalization across units so we cannot have abstract labor in the domestic fear it has to be by necessity concrete labor right so so that's that's one and the the, the second thing is that I have said that capital does not have full control over this this sphere, but um, you know often when I've talked about it this way, uh, it may be misunderstood sometimes by saying that it lies outside of the circuit of value production. Well, it doesn't. So what I mean is it doesn't fall within the direct control of capital. It doesn't mean it lies outside of the circuit. A, a, a very simple example would be um, you working in your garden or one working in their garden uh, is, is a non-value producing work. It's a life making activity. It's a concrete labor. It's a beautiful thing. Uh, however, you can only work in your garden when your wage labor schedule allows you to. So you can't simply work in your garden when you want to. So the way that work is um, uh, different, uh, the, the way that work is uh, done is actually shaped by the impulses of wage work, right? So even though it is not, but again, uh, because it's human concrete labor, it constantly has these potentials for disruption. And, you know, obviously wage labor does that too. That's what a strike is. But we should also think about the, the moments of disruption that can happen here because capital doesn't have direct control. To come to the more important question is when um, have they ever struck work simultaneously? Um, you know, uh, I, I 
it, it, let's remember that the two most important um, revolutions of modern times, the, the French and the Russian, 1789 and, 1905, and 1917, both started off with bread riots, which was, you know, women, and, and this is acknowledged in all of the contemporary writing, that it was women breaking um, through, you know, baker's shops where bread was being hoarded or, you know, um, looting shops and, and, and demanding bread for themselves and their families, that actually sparked off the revolution, which set off then a series of wage strikes, right? So, so, it, so the question for us as social justice activists should be um, to, to consider um, not so much that these two spheres are separate, but to consider that sometimes a resistance will spark in one sphere, but can easily spread to the other, right? That's very helpful. While we're waiting for people to post some questions, if they have them, maybe I'll follow up. I wonder if you could say, this is more of a technical issue in the, in the dialectic, but I wonder if you could say a little more about how the domestic sphere where the reproductive sphere is included. So for example, I can see it as a point of resist, possible point of resistance because there's just other values or purposes. You call them life-making, right? And there's remnants of, not just remnants, but full-fledged endorsement of other hermeneutic frameworks like religious ones or uh, whatever it be. Uh, outside of the workplace and even inside of the workplace that go along alongside it. So you could say, well, life making is a separate value and it can offer a point of resistance on, on its terms at times. But there's also a pressure from, from capital, let's say, to, um, to reduce that life making activity to the absolute minimum because it's, even though it doesn't contribute to value, or you could say it doesn't, you can't generalize it, so you can't measure value on diaper changes. That's a, a really useful way to, to put it. Um, the worker has to, let's say, cover in the value of their labor, not only herself, but her dependents. So it's contributing in some way to the value of labor. Like the magnitude of the value of labor is also how much, this um, heteronormative family requires to go on, right? So if capital could get rid of it, I guess it would, no? Um, get rid of the family. The domestic sphere, reproductive labor as much as possible. I'm thinking of the other side, which is not resistance from those other um, positions, but the interest would be, you know, kind of like, um, Yeah, to get to get to get rid of it. So it doesn't seem to be possible, but I wonder if you see pressures from that side also, whatever that means, automation. Right. Um, okay. So um, so to get rid of it, um, because it wants more um, time in the wage sphere. Is is that what you're saying? Well, it would theoretically reduce the value of labor if labor didn't also have to provide for the lives of its of the laborers dependents right sure yeah but that that's i mean let's think about um you know the historical examples here that that's a really really um great point actually paul and i'm, I'm um very grateful for it because we should have talked about it a little bit. Like, let's think about the historical origins of capitalism as, as a historic system in, in, let's say, you know, the Northern England, right? So, uh, I mean, this is, this is the, uh, where, where Marx in volume one talks so, um, uh, so laudably about the, the, the factory inspectors, right? Because what capital was actually doing was pulling all of the labor uh, into the factory and therefore thereby completely undermining social reproduction of the working class family. So people were just dying. And I always say when I teach uh, Capital Volume One is that the companion piece is not necessarily um, uh, 
excuse me, Grindrisse, but the companion piece is actually Engels's uh, condition of the working class in England, right? Because that shows you in, in very um, descriptive ways what happens if uh, uh, social reproduction, uh, capital does not kind of close its eyes to that loss of profit by maintaining the working class family. What happens it, it undermines its very um, possibility of existence, right? Because without the working class family, without the life making, there would be no workers, right? So, it, so this is in a way something that we have to actually think about really, and this is why I'm so grateful for the point you bring up, we have to think about this very clearly in terms of the current ecological emergency, because accumulation is actually pushing, not so much in terms of the early, in terms of the 18th century or early 19th century, um, sort of the extinguishing of the working class family, but it is pushing again uh, to a point where it's undermining even the possibility of value production and accumulation by pushing the planet to, at, to the edge of, of a climate catastrophe, which will undermine its own condition of possibility, right? So I think this is the dynamic that we have to be attentive to constantly under capitalism, that this what it can get away with by not giving and what it can, what it is forced to give, albeit reluctantly, in order to ensure this continuous, reliable production, reproduction circuit. That's very helpful. Thank you. And I love the picture of capital, the capital system as being this kind of anxious old person <laughs> worried about the incursions on all sides. We have some questions, and I want to start with a question by Elena Gomez. If we can unmute Elena, and if you don't mind asking your question. Hi, thank you so much. Um, I was just wondering if you could talk a little bit about um, how you see the kind of historicization of SRT in relation to Marxist feminism, um, particularly in the 1970s. Um, I'm interested in kind of whether you see this as like a theoretical departure or if it's an extension or if it's kind of out of a different tradition um, and whether SRT was, is able to ask questions that were maybe not available to the theorists such as Selma James and Leopoldina Fucinati, etc. Thanks. Shall I just answer or wait for more? Would you like to gather a few or do you want to answer one by one? It's up to you. Uh, let, me just, let me just try to answer this because um, I think it's a very oh. important one. So thank you for that, Alina. Um, so I think first of all, uh, we should start any discussion about 1970s um, sort of Marxist feminism by saying that this, version of SRT as we develop from Capital Volume 1 in more recent times. And, and you know, just, just to go back, Lisa Vogel, who kind of pioneers some of this thinking, Lisa's book was actually published in the early 80s. So, you know, even though it has um, had a sort of regeneration in recent times, um, and we can talk about why that regeneration has happened because I have some ideas about that. It, um, Lisa's work actually isn't um, too sort of modern. You know, Marxism and the Oppression of Women was first published in 1983. So, um, but it, it is actually, it, it forms a departure from the earlier Marxist feminist uh, thinking on domestic labor, okay? Because SRT, as we talked about, is, is we talk a lot about domestic labor, but it is very different kind of placing and positioning and theorizing and exploring of domestic labor, very different from um, Selma James and uh, Sylvia Federici and uh, uh, Leopoldo uh, uh, Fortunati. So um, the first thing to say is I think I owe a debt of gratitude, a big debt of gratitude to the 1970s domestic labor uh, debate. 
okay? And, and the reason for that is, remember, domestic labor as a theoretical category uh, lies, you know, the seeds of it lie in Capital Volume 1. The discussion of it happens in early Marxist and socialist thought, you know, one can think about Alexandra Kollontai, but it is, but it's, it, it's kind of that, 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 that discussion is submerged and, and lost in history. And it is these comrades and activists and scholar activists of the 1970s who resurrect this category, uh, politicize it and theorize it, okay? So we all actually will owe a real debt of gratitude to these, uh, to these thinkers and activists. And they don't just theorize it, they actually go to battle on it, right? Which is, which is most, most important. So having said that, I also have to say, as you might have guessed, as, as I indicated, that I don't think, I don't agree with the way they theorize domestic labor because uh, these theorists argue that domestic labor actually creates value. And, um, uh, and, and I don't think it does. Um, it is the precondition for value, but it doesn't actually create value. So, so that's, a, that's a sort of major uh, difference we have in the way it is theorized. And, and that's, you know, and, and it, 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 because it's theorized slightly differently, it often can have different strategic um, conclusions, right? So if we can, th if we realize that uh, domestic labor can create value, then we can think about ways in which striking um, uh, or, or demanding wages for domestic labor is actually going to disrupt capital. And, you know, we have to, and again, if there is, you know, uh, uh, if there is a strike to stop domestic labor, as the women's strikes have shown, then that is actually a very powerful uh, uh, means to do that. Uh, but we also have to think about the ways in which uh, it, wage labor has a conditioning impulse on domestic labor, okay? And so to separate those two, uh, in my mind, is, is, not, um, is not gonna be helpful. But I wanna end with saying that if there is a barricade, uh, then I think, all of us are on the same side of that barricade vis-a-vis uh, -vis how we proceed in the feminist struggle. And I think these discussions and debates and differences are actually very productive in which ways of moving forward. There's a healthy roll of questions in the, in the chat. So I'm gonna, I'll read the next. Do you wanna take them one by one or do you prefer grouping? It's, it's okay, <laughs> whichever way. So the next one I'm going to read out from Vanessa Gubbins, following up on that one. Could you say something more about the potential of anti-capitalist charge in life-making activities in relation to the difficulties that can arise due to real subsumption? Okay, do you, um, real subsumption in the, uh, could you explain, could you, talk about it a little more. Vanessa, do you want to hop on and? Yeah, just, just tell me um, how, do, uh, how you relate um, uh, sort of domestic labor or life making up activity to real subsumption. What, what did you mean by that? We're just unmuting and getting sure. ourselves ready. Okay. Audrey, can you unmute Vanessa? Can you hear me? Yes. Yes, we have you now. Hi, sorry about that. Thank you so much for such an incredible um, talk. I actually think you already answered my question <laughs> when you were answering Paul's earlier. So, um, but, but just to say, I, I was just thinking of real subsumption as the way in which uh, the reproductive sphere, the life-making sphere, is already determined by what's happening and where capital more directly has um, an effect. And I was thinking about the, the later capi uh, chapters in, in Capital, where you go from formal subsumption to real subsumption, is once um, capital has become a totalizing system that 
affects absolutely everything and everything is read through that lens, even life making activities. So I thought that would perhaps, um, you know, it, it's, it's what has been read as somewhat of a more pessimistic Marx in some regard, but I think I was just wondering if you had any thoughts on how that could affect the potential, the revolutionary potential of, of these fears that are less directly controlled by wage labor. Um, okay. No, that's a great question. Thank you, Vanessa. Um, so I'm going to start, uh, I'm going to try to answer that with the lyrics of a union song from the uh, earlier part of the um, 20th century uh, and, and the American Union movement. It, it's a song that I, I find fascinating because there is a recognition in the early Union movement of the unity of these fears that you're talking about, right? So this song goes, and I will not um, subject you to my singing, but um, the song goes, um, it's a strike song and it's supposedly from, from the workers. Um, and it says, um, my something like my children are seven in numbers and and something and and they're all starving but the refrain is uh striking striking we're striking for pairs of shoes and then you know then there is another description of you know all the things that the family is deprived of and then it says striking striking we're striking for bottles of milk okay so in other words there's a recognition in the actual struggle, which is your world of real subsumption, right? Where everything is under the dominance of capital. But the reason why you are engaged in wage labor is not for money, but for what money can buy, right? So that, so in other words, the relationship between wage labor and, and life is constant and is actually not ruptured in the consciousness of the worker. Where it gets ruptured is in later sort of um, uh, both, you know, the left movement as well as the union movement where we see that in the workplace, we are fighting for wages. Well, actually let's reverse that idea and say, yes, we are fighting for wages, but we are actually fighting for an enhancement of life. That's why we want higher wages, right? Because we want more um, uh, relaxation time. We want better health care. We want better food for our families. So that um, union song actually, for me, unites these two spheres in a very beautiful way because there is a recognition in the early part of the union movement in this country that the two spheres are intimately connected and we are actually all fighting for life-making activities and the expansion of life-making activities. And in fact, the wage is an unnatural shadow that falls between our self and our means of sustaining that self, okay? There should not be that unnatural divide between us and our means of subsistence, but the wage is an artificial barrier between those two, which is why, uh, you know, one of um, the, uh, the sort of uh, the young um, SRT theorists, um, Aaron Jaffe, has written, recently written a, a short essay where he talks about um, uh, the, the potential of these life-making uh, explorations under uh, the pandemic, where, you know, the pandemic has kind of agitated the ubiquity and the um, essential nature of the wage, right? That, the, that we constantly go to work and we get the wage and we come home with the disruption of things under the, uh, uh, under the pandemic, we can see almost transparently the unnaturalness of the wage, right? Uh, 
uh, because there's been so much uh, secession in the workplace and in, in the home. We also see what is actually essential work to keep the world going, and it's not stockbrokers and, and bankers. It is actually life-making activities of teachers, nurses, and, and uh, people in the home, and care home, etc. So um, I don't know if, if this answers your question, but I don't think it, the, the architecture of Capital Volume 1 actually never distracts from the fact that under real subsumption that there, there is this sort of um, hegemonic monolith that is capital that extinguishes all possibility of worker struggle. In fact, what it reveals is this constant dynamic of workers trying to win back life-making resources from capital and capital constantly having to negotiate as to how much it can give and how much it will give or is forced to give. Thank you so much. That was wonderful. Thanks, Vanessa. I want to ask a very short follow-up to that. How can you tell in life-making activities which ones are for life and which ones are for capital? Mm, when that. they're... <laughs> That's a really, really interesting question. So, so this is, I think, connected to your earlier question, Paul, that um, while we think about um, concrete labor and concretely laboring bodies, we can never forget that we live under the shadow of a systemic reproduction of abstract labor, right? So. Um, so while, you know, uh, kissing your love, loved one is a life-making activity, you can often, um, you know, finding time to do so is part of uh, what makes uh, it difficult sometimes, right? So, but what can you tell, but um, what is life-making activity? I, I, I think uh, there are, the, the problem, the, the, the fact that you can even ask that question should alert us to the fact that through historically, life-making activities are continuously commodified, right? So um, uh, it, just like domestic labor is actually commodified. You know, if you have enough money as a woman, you can get away with not doing a jot of domestic labor and actually um, farming it out to immigrant uh, women of color who come and sweep and dust and clean and do whatever it is uh, in, in your home and you wouldn't have to do a bit of work, right? So, so capital will constantly, as we know, will try to commodify um, uh, every element, even in the sphere of life making, right? However, this does not finally, I, I want to constantly go back to the idea that that does not mean that it always succeeds, that that charge and that dynamic of concrete labor continuously remains and actually has to remain if capital has to, um, uh, you know, um, uh, has to survive. So, uh, women or female marked bodies have to give birth. Uh, you know, sometimes they'll give birth under uh, certain kinds of historical conditions and other times under others. But, you know, th those sort of processes have to continuously take place. And it actually isn't capitalists' worth to actually, you know, factory farm an entire uh, generation of workers, right? It, it just isn't the kind of investment it has to make in order to do that, uh, in, in changing social mores, in creating such factory farms. It just isn't worth it. I mean, it gets this work done uh, very cheaply, free of cost in most working class households. Why should it invest in, in you know, that kind of a, a fully, auto uh, well, again, you cannot fully um, automatize care. I mean, this is, this is the big thing, right? So they, they, they try to uh, mechanically reproduce care, especially 
in the privatized medical industry. And we see the problems with that, right? So uh, when you say that the uh, that there are little beepers that the nurse will only stay by your bedside uh, for five minutes and, you know, and has to tick, tick on, the, uh, on the chart and each, the nurse has to complete, you know, X number of bed visits per day, uh, it just doesn't work, you know, uh, uh, in the sense that care cannot be, um, you know, mechanized in that, that, that extent. And that's that's a problem that that capital has, as it were. So I'm going to tell my partner that she's not kissing me just to make sure I'm home at the end of the day to make dinner. <laughs> but I want to turn now. This is a good moment to I think turn to Gabrielle Weinant's question. I don't know, Gabrielle. I think just maybe left the room. But if Gabrielle is here, this was a question about the commodification of of reproductive labor. Can we open up Gabrielle's voice? Okay, Gabrielle is here, but on the phone, but we should still be able to unmute. Would you like, Gabrielle, would you like me to read the question? Okay. This is the most bizarre way to communicate with anyone. Thanks for a great talk. Gabrielle says, it strikes me you mainly consider SRT in relation to its input to the value of labor power as itself an uncommodified form of labor. I'm curious what you make of the growing commodification of reproductive labor, which you just began to talk about, which often occurs through the social state in partial or limited commodified forms. What is the significance of the absorption of so much of this labor into the labor market in the last 50 years? And what should we make of the historical limits to capital that have arisen in its employment. Um, so, um, you know, um, I think by historical limits, I think um, that's that's what we talked about. That you can't mechanize care completely. Okay, so you can commodify um, domestic labor and the reproduction of life to a certain extent, but you cannot mechanize or commodify it entirely. And uh, so that's, that would be my first kind, kind, kind of uh, response to you. Um, the, the other side of it is that when you, I, I mean, um, my um, friend and colleague in UMass Amherst, um, Nancy Fulbert, who's a feminist economist, she talks about, for instance, um, one of the problems of workers in the care industry striking, right? So she calls it the, the love problem, okay? So what's the love problem? That often, uh, especially for home, house, uh, home health um, uh, uh, care workers, right? Those who come into the home to care for the elderly, et cetera, who, by the way, did the majority of the caring for um, our elders during this pandemic and are were primarily women of color, right? And so um, we're absolutely at the at the uh, sort of the full blast of the of the uh, disease of the virus. So um, what happens with home health care workers? Um, you know, because care is such a um, sort of human, I want to say, human and indeed anti-capitalist impulse, right? Care and love are human and anti-capitalist impulses that we carry as a species. So even when you commodify it, it actually ha creates certain um, uh, problems, right? So for instance, with a home health care worker, she gets so involved in the care of her patient, of her client, the person she's providing uh, care for, that when, when it comes to striking, she feels, well, I can't strike because this will leave this really vulnerable person high and dry. And, and this actually will affect their life chances. So how can I strike, right? So this is something that um, care workers face all the time. 
in, in terms of striking, you know, that whenever, um, as we all know, there was a wave, wonderful wave of teacher strike in this country uh, two years ago in 2017, uh, you know, the first thing was, oh, how could you be so selfish and strike because this affects the lives and futures of our children, okay? So when nurses go on strike, how can you possibly strike? Because you are endangering the health, the very life, you know, the messy, fleshy life of, of human beings, right? So care work, at this, this kind of, uh, so in other words, it is not just care work is commodified, but the impulse to care is often weaponized by capital to actually stop care workers from striking, right? So that very impulse that makes us human capital weaponizes against us. So you can't strike because you ought to care. Um, I think my answer to that, I learned actually from concrete worker struggles. So workers then had to devise a way to actually frame their struggle, which shows that they're striking because they care. So it is because they care for the future lives of their students, of their patients, so that they may care properly and sustainably that they are striking. So in other words, um, you know, in all of these care work strikes that you, um, if you follow, as I do, you will see that workers reframe the struggle into actually talking about the depth of care that they have for their patients and for their students, and which is why they're forced to strike, right? So, um, so it, it, I remember 2012, the Chicago Teachers Union, when they went for strike, that was like, you know, the first teacher strike in so many, so many years of recent memory, and it was such a great strike. And remember that for the Chicago teachers, 80% of their students are students of color, okay? And, uh, you know, uh, the, the, the mayor of Chicago at the time closed schools, mostly on the south side of Chicago, where, you know, the, all the um, uh, black children and, and Latina children went to school, right? So when the but the framing I thought of this Chicago teacher strike was so wonderful, said that our working conditions are our students' learning conditions, right? So in other words, unless our working conditions improve, we are not able to love and care for our students in the way our students deserve, right? So it was a very interesting, to me, learning process for us to see how workers in struggle, just as Marx predicted, actually can reframe the struggle for care into talking about real substantive care rather than the weaponized care that capital forces upon them. It makes me think of a beautiful thing that tends to happen in strikes and in in-group actions, that there's a, a kind of care that arises among the strikers that's really very different than anything we're talking about, kind of the ideal. Okay, we have a set of questions and I'm mindful of your um, labor power. <laughs> no, that's much. fine, that's fine. So we'll go a little longer? You sure. okay? Okay. Absolutely. Yeah, that's a great question because, you know, when we say, um, we want more public service, right? We want um, more um, uh, state intervention um, in, in the market. So we want these services taken off the market, taken off private, uh, privatized sphere and into public control, right? So that sounds like a great demand that we're saying that it should healthcare should be public or education should be public. We should have public laundries and so on. But we are also saying at the same time, if we go via Foucault, we are also saying that then that means that the capitalist state is actually in charge of this, right? So which is ought to be a scary prospect, right? So, um, so we are saying um, healthcare uh, education should be public but the word public actually um, 
hides in a way the idea that what we mean by public is also the capitalist state because we are asking for state control as it were, right? So, um, so I think that's a very in interesting and, and important um, uh, issue that we ought to be discussing. Uh, what are the limits? And this is where I think um, uh, Marxist state theory is something that we have to, um, this should be like the sort of next chapter of social reproduction theory. Like how does social reproduction theory engage with Marxist th state theory, right? Because uh, I think it has to in, 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 in a way, because the state is both the repository of the disciplining functions of capital, as well as the public functions of the reproduction of life, right? So, so for instance, um, <coughs> you know, when um, this early, uh, like, you know, I, I, I don't know if you're in Paul's class, um, but uh, Emerson, but it, you know, uh, in, in Capital Volume One, Marx, uh, as I said, uh, you know, is, is absolutely, um, um, full of praise for the government inspectors who come into the, the factories and inspect those conditions. You know, he goes through all these blue books of the um, inspectors and, and when he writes his, uh, especially his chapter on the working day. And, uh, and that is where we are talking about that the, even in the sphere of production, in the point of production question, that their, their uh, Marx is uh, welcoming state oversight over simple operation of private capital, right? That it's only the capitalist state that steps in to actually regulate how um, uh, uh, wages are determined on the factory floor and the fact that capital is actually undermining its own condition of possibility. So it's the capitalist state steps in and says, okay, you need to stop and you need to reconfigure the whole thing here. And, and so labor laws are passed and, and, and so on, or so work. But it, it's the same today, right? So uh, we are asking for uh, uh, the, the government to step in to regulate healthcare or education as it does in several you know, Nordic countries. Uh, but we cannot forget that it is the capitalist state, right? So it's not the, um, uh, you know, sort of, we are not talking about workers' control over the process of production. So the capitalist state will have, uh, a, you know, will impose the law of capital or will impose the law of value to a certain extent. And we cannot expect otherwise from it. This is where I think, um, social democratic governments uh, will join the First World War, you know, 1914, right? And, and shock Lenin and Luxembourg into it. This is why social democratic governments today are often virulent practicers of border control, that they want strong borders against migrants because they want to control the, the, the way, the distribution of the wage within their own national economies, right? So on the one hand, and this is why this contradiction of the capitalist state providing life-making activities. On the one hand, we celebrate, we absolutely want free healthcare, free, um, uh, free, free education uh, from our taxes, right? But we cannot forget that the state ultimately will also impose the law of value, okay? Because it is the capitalist state, it's not a worker state. So, so for instance, what we see is this dark uh, development in recent times that in the Nordic countries, there is uh, this, this argument uh, that yes, we have healthcare, but it is only for Swedish workers. So all these immigrants need to be driven Yes, we have good free education, but it is for our lovely white children and not these Muslims. You know, I was shocked when I um, went to Copenhagen last year. It seems like a million years ago that we used to travel. So, um, and, and, and the papers where the left-wing papers uh, were filled with stories of how um, uh, Muslims were actually 
uh, Muslim immigrants had to live in ghettos and had to follow an entirely different program of sending their children to school and uh, daycare from the, you know, the good white citizens who were full citizens in, 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 in the country, right? So we can see that even the, um, the, the generalized reproduction of life-making activities, which we support under the aegis of the capitalist state can have its own limits because it is the capitalist state and not you know, a, a workers controlled cooperative or what have you. Got it. So basically the kind of principled differences between like the good and bad demands are mostly in terms of like the status of the state of like racism and uh, democratic versus authoritarian tendencies. So like we can see social reproductive demands in the a service of like Strasserite Nazism or whatever. So it's like, those are the kinds of ways we should distinguish them then. I'm not sure I understood uh, that. Just that my original question was like the principal demands between the social reproduction demands, which are disruptive versus non-disruptive have to take in all those other contexts, basically. Of course, yes. Yeah, that is. yeah thank you. Okay, I want to, um, if you still have the energy, give the floor to Paul Reiter to ask a final question. Of course. Oh, goodness, that's a lot of pressure. Um, after such an, such, an, such an incredible talk and a, <laughs> and a wonderful discussion as well. Um, thanks so much. Um, I, uh, I have a, a question, um, uh, a couple of questions, but I'll, I'll limit myself since the hour is so advanced and, and uh, just ask this one. You, know, you, you started out um, talking about uh, or positioning your uh, your argument in response to one that uh, suggests that the book is really very much focused on abstract labor, and that's ultimately what's at stake here. And I thought you did a really wonderful job of of debunking that in a in a in a theoretical way. Um, and I wonder if there's also a, a more since so much of it, this is about the relation between the theoretical and the empirical or historical and capital, if there's an empirical way to, uh, to push back against that as, as well. And because it seems to me that um, outside of the working day chapter, there are just so many places in capital um, where Marx points out the tendency of the system to exploit a particularly vulnerable population and and use that um, to uh, uh, to make conditions generally worse or gain a kind of general advantage, um, and so that uh, even if he doesn't frame this point as a kind of of uh, in, in part of this theoretical argument, it it emerges as uh, uh, <clears throat> as part of the argument that that he's making that there's a tendency in this system. Um, systematically to go after vulnerable populations so that if there's any inequality at all among the, the workers, that inequality will be exploited. And since it's very hard to imagine that there could ever be um, any uh, total lack of, of inequality among the working population under capitalism and its various pressures, that it's, uh, it's therefore, uh, seem, that it therefore seems very unlikely that this book would be suggesting that these inequalities are the inequalities other than class inequalities are somehow incidental to capitalist exploitation. That there's a there's an accumulation of evidence that you could present, in other words, in response to this, in addition to the theor theoretical argument that you're making. Oh, I completely agree. And I think, you know, when when I say that um, uh, SRT um, takes issues with certain formulations in the way labor power um, is presented in capital. I mean, I always um, couch that in, in say, in, in the general framework that SRT only exists as a theory using capital volume one as its architecture, right? Because it is from the, from the understanding of how labor power is crucial to the functioning of capital and how that has a <coughs> um, uh, and how that 
creates the conditions of possibility of the system as a whole, that the starting point of that is uh, Capital Volume One. And there are several, several passages in the text itself that point us back constantly to this reproduction of labor power and its uh, various modalities. What Capital Volume One doesn't do, but what um, what Marx himself does in, in other texts is talk about the gendered and racialized uh, nature of the reproduction of labor power and, and the effect it has, right? But um, I completely agree with you that the text is actually uh, peppered, it's, it's studded with uh, various um, issues about the, the uh, potential of uh, concrete labor, of um, of the potential of uh, the, the spaces of the reproduction of labor power becoming the sort of anti-capitalist um, uh, resistance to uh, wage labor. So, I, I mean, you know, you never get the impression through the reading of the text that um, abstract, the dominance of abstract labor is complete or even um, uh, absolute. In in uh, in it, it is it is that way in the form in which the system operates. But you get this constant understanding of the dynamic, the pushbacks uh, to it throughout throughout the text. So I, right. I, well, there is frequently this message that in 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 some ways uh, things getting worse is progress because it it galvanizes workers' resistance and it. Uh, ripens the conditions under which some sort of meaningful change will occur, right? I mean, in the working day chapter, there's so much back and forth where he uh, points out that the, <clears throat> the uh, laws that uh, regulate factory labor, that it, yes, you know, this is a positive thing. On the other hand, they've had these negative unintended consequences of in intensifying um, capitalist production in some ways, making it even more ferocious because it has to operate within a limited, a more limited time framework. But at the same time, then that um, uh, <clears throat> very, uh, what you could see as a setback has the effect in his estimation uh, of bringing about conditions that will hasten the uh, advance of the workers' movement. And so ultimately that, you know, could be a good thing. Um, I mean, that this is obviously a, you know, a, a a discussion that that uh, could go on um, because you're at the point of, and this is one of the, of course, one of the challenges of the book that it is so big and diverse, and um, there are uh, uh, moments where, or, or there is uh, some amount of, of variation among the different parts and contradictory statements, or at least contrasting statements, and what reading you'll come up with can depend on which parts you choose to emphasize, these parts where Marx seems more optimistic or parts where uh, there's a certain mood of pessimism that, 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 that sets in um, and uh, uh, to make your arguments stick. If you're gonna argue in this way, you know, then you have to really catalog exhaustively and, and show at the end of the day that you have a lot of evidence and in, in, in support for what you're, you know, what you're saying. And I, um, I mean, I do think that there's a lot of evidence to, to support what you were just saying. And, and uh, uh, in any case, um, I, uh, I'm, I feel like I'm now going from the question uh, mode to the comment mode. And I, I don't want to do that because this is, you know, your presentation. So let me pull back and, and give you a last word. Oh, that was excellent. Thank you. No, no, no. I, <laughs> I, I wish we had more time. I always think yeah. that, you know, even after two, two hours of everyone talking, <laughs> all this talking. So I, 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 I want, obviously, this is, this is the starting point, I hope, of more discussions on, on this subject. I just want to frame, um, uh, sort of um, use what you said as a point of departure um, about the sort of intensification of accumulation urging workers um, to you know higher levels of struggle uh, I just want to use that as a point of departure to say but in our current times I think we have to frame that somewhat in the context of the ecological crisis right so um, we can think about um, you know uh, expanded uh, reproduction and extensive um, 
uh, drive for accumulation, urging worker struggle, but it may all be too late in the sense that, you know, the planet may have moved, be may move, may have moved beyond a tipping point where uh, such struggles will ultimately not yield the results that we, we, we want, that we may not be able to move to a, 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 an alternative system of capitalism. And I think here um, I find Walter Benjamin uh, quite useful in thinking about our current moment um, in, in, in terms of, uh, you know, the, the, the planetary crisis um, looming over us, that we think about workers' struggles more as a break upon this hurtling train of accumulation, um, more as a break than as necessarily anything else, that we have to first stop, you know, the, the, the current sort of constant drive. We have to think about workers' struggles uh, because otherwise the train is going to, and unfortunately we are all on the train, not just capitalists, and the train is going to hurtle beyond everybody's control and, and uh, to the common ruin of contending classes, as, as uh, the famous quote goes. But I don't want to uh, end on that extremely dark note. I want to end on the note that that kind of possibility of the common ruin of contending classes is constantly being challenged by a new generation of uprising, as we saw in over the summer, the, the, the most fierce and the most wonderful multiracial uprising that we saw that challenged the very uh, processes of um, differential life making. And uh, the, the children's uh, strikes that we saw last year against ecological devastation. So I want to end on that note and look towards those kind of horizons as our possibilities for the future. And we thank you for that and for the talk. A great round of applause. Thank you so much. Would be happening. Thanks again for coming.